All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 8 as we continue our study in the book of Acts, God's Spirit through God's people. And we get a beautiful example of how the Lord was working through His people as the church began and how He wants to continue that here today in our generation. I want to talk to you today about using God. Using God, because we can often get a role reversal taking place that instead of thinking about how God wants to use us, we just think about how we want to use God. And it's typical for people to pray and to constantly ask God for stuff, and if we're not careful, we begin to think that God exists to serve us instead of us existing to serve the Lord. God is not a genie in a bottle. He's not your celestial Santa Claus. I think sometimes we forget when we pray that we're talking to God, we, we're so self-centered that we have a tendency to go to God and say, okay, God, you know, I need this and I want that and, and you're a little slow on providing that and so come on, God, you know. <clears throat> it would be really good for our prayer life if just once God inter- in, just manifested himself and said, who do you think you're talking to? Now you might say, hold on a second, Pastor Gary, the Bible invites us to come and to make our request known to God. I mean, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. True. And that's what prayer is. It's calling upon God's resources. We need what God has to offer. But we're not just called to ask so that we may receive. We're also called to seek so that we may find. And we ask Not because, you know, prayer isn't so that God can carry out our will. Prayer is so that we can carry out God's will. And so often we get the roles reversed. And if we're not careful, we start using God. And we live in a time where people use the name of Jesus for their gain and for their benefit, you know. We see it all the time, especially in business. Oh, well, I'm a Christian too. What church do you go to? And I've got this little cross on my business card. I've got this little fish on my car or whatever. And we try to market ourselves to the Christian community and we use the name of Jesus to try and make a bridge And all the while, we're just thinking about the profit margin, not how we're going to glorify God in the whole process of this transaction. There are so many things that have the name of Jesus on them in our day and age where Jesus is in heaven going, hey, don't put my name on that. I don't want to be, I mean, you say you're going to help this lady fix her plumbing and that you're a Christian plumber and everything, and then you just rake her over the coals and and overcharge her, and you don't do what you say you're going to do, and and all, you're a Christian businessman, you know, hey, take my name off of your card, because you're just using me to try and gain the trust of other people, and all the while, you're not even interested in representing me or being used by me. And so we see here in Acts chapter 8 that we see a a great example of both trying to use God and then someone being used by God and the contrast between the two. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death, that is the death of Stephen. He was just stoned to death for his faith. Remember that deacons were chosen in Acts chapter 6, these men to help run the church. The first two deacons that were mentioned were Stephen and Philip. 
And so they highlighted Stephen. He stood up for the gospel. He was the first martyr of the church. And Saul, who would become Paul the apostle, is there consenting to Stephen's death. At this time, Saul was the main persecutor of the church. And at that time, it says, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Interesting. In Acts 1.8, what did Jesus say? You shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. It's where the church began. And Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was God's plan. We're not going to have a holy huddle here and all stay in Jerusalem. We need to reach the world. The whole Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs to know about the kingdom of God. Well, the church was stuck in Jerusalem. They had not gone beyond Jerusalem yet. God cares about the whole world. God cares about every tribe, tongue, and nation. And sometimes we just get focused on our little world and all we care about is the quality of our lives and we don't even really have on our mind or on our radar that A, God, you know, the gospel is supposed to go out to everybody and we're supposed to care. Now we can't care about everybody, it's a big world out there, but that's the heart of God. And someone who has such a heart for missions, you know, people sometimes treat this as, well, you know, there's so many people here in America that still need Jesus. Why are we, why are we bypassing them to get to, you know, these far lands? Because Jesus said to. And I don't know how fair it is that people in America get a thousand chances to walk with Jesus while there are other people who still hadn't had one. And it's a thrill to share the gospel with people who have never heard it before. It is a thrill. Well, the apostles had not known this thrill yet. They're still in Jerusalem. They hadn't obeyed the Lord and gone beyond Jerusalem yet. So the Lord is allowing this persecution to take place, putting a fire under the church, and they're being scattered. And through these circumstances, they're being pushed out of their nest, and they're going to be going to the different parts of the world by the sovereignty of God. Verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, verse 4, there there were those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. That was the Lord's intention. So his will is being done. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, we talked earlier about how God was doing miracles and signs and wonders through the apostles. Then we see him doing it through Stephen, who was not an apostle. Now we see the Holy Spirit work in the same way through Philip, who was not an apostle either. These were ordinary men doing extraordinary things by the Spirit of the Lord. And it describes more, verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in the city. So God's using Philip in a powerful way and miraculous things are happening through him. Now watch what happens. We're going to talk about using God. Watch what happens next. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. So this man's commonly referred to as Simon the sorcerer. And he was impressing people and uh, trying to convince people that he was someone great. Listen, if you have to tell people you're someone great, you're not as great as you think you are. 
But this guy really hungered for power, really hungered for popularity and attention. And so he was deceiving people, doing illusions, perhaps even tapping into demonic powers to impress the people. And uh, so it says in verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. Why? Because the power coming out of Philip was greater than the power that Simon had and he knew it. Friends, there is no greater power than the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I think we forget that we serve a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the members of the Godhead function differently in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And He can do whatever He wants through us. Let's not underestimate his power. And so Simon, seeing Philip, his words are more powerful. His, his miracles are more powerful. This guy isn't doing any illusions. He's not deceiving the people. He's not tapping into the dark side, but the light. And he even becomes to believe himself. So Simon became a believer. It's important for us to take note of. This is no longer Simon the sorcerer. This is a guy who became a follower of Christ. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed and when he was baptized he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to take... Um, a little sidebar here, because as all this is taking place, there's some good theology about the Holy Spirit that we're going to touch on. The apostles are in Jerusalem. They hear that revival is breaking out in Samaria through Philip's ministry. People have become believers in Christ. But it says that the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, verse 15, who when they had come down prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit had come upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So we often refer to the Holy Spirit relating to us in different ways. The Holy Spirit can be with you, in you, and or upon you. It's important to recognize those three distinctions. First, the Holy Spirit can be with you. In fact, is with you. The Holy Spirit is with everyone, whether they believe in Christ or not. The Holy Spirit is trying to woo people to the Father. So the Holy Spirit's working on everybody. When you become a believer in Christ, you become born again by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now is not just with you, but He's in you. And you're born again. You become a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in you. But then there's a third dimension where the Holy Spirit can come upon you. And this is a filling and an empowering of the Holy Spirit that is in addition to that born-again experience. And I describe it this way. If you've ever made chocolate milk, if you fill up a glass with milk and then squeeze or pour in the chocolate, what does it do? it sinks to the bottom. And the milk is still pretty much white. Is the chocolate in there? Yeah, but it's at the bottom. What do you have to do next? You gotta stir it up. And when you stir it up, 
All of a sudden now the milk and the chocolate blends together and everything in the glass is affected by that chocolate. In the same way, as Christians, the Holy Spirit can be in us, but man, it's all collected at the bottom and we're not getting the full benefit. We got to get stirred up. We got to get stirred up. That's why in Ephesians 5.18 it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's in you, but you got to activate it. You got to get filled with it. You got to get stirred up so that the Holy Spirit is functioning in you to its fullest the way that He wants to. It's possible to be a stagnant Christian where the Holy Spirit has now, you've just allowed it to settle. And so. These guys experience this stirring up of the Spirit, the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they have that epigonoskos experience, a Greek word that speaks of the Holy Spirit coming upon us in an experiential way where you're all of a sudden now aware and conscious of the presence of God. See, God is everywhere all the time, yes? We refer to it in theology as the omnipresence of God. But we might might not be aware of the presence of God. So there's a difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. Where you experience God's Spirit manifested in your life and all of a sudden now the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're stirred up and you're now under the influence of the Spirit of God. So it's possible to be a Christian and to not be influenced by the Spirit because it's just all settled at the bottom. So we need to constantly allow ourselves to be influenced by the Lord and stirred up. And that's what the apostles were doing here um, with these new believers in Samaria. Verse 18, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Okay, this is where things get interesting. Simon, the previously the sorcerer, sees, man, these guys from Jerusalem lay hands on people and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. By the way, what did they see that helped them to realize the Holy Spirit came upon them? What physical manifestation took place? We don't know. But what is common is that people think, oh, they spoke in tongues, and so that's how everybody knew the Holy Spirit came upon them, because they spoke in tongues. Not true. It's very clear in the epistles that not everyone has the same gifting. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you've been given the gift of speaking in tongues. So I personally don't believe that that was the sign that gave evidence that the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Because there are no doubt people here this morning who have the Holy Spirit but don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, and some of us do. You're no better or no worse as a Christian whether you have that gift. There are many gifts. What am I supposed to walk around going, well, I got the gift of giving, and obviously you don't, so I'm better than you are. There's lots of different gifts. And so how that was manifested, we don't know for sure. But you just know. When God's Spirit is moving on somebody, we often say this, man, she's on fire for the Lord. He's on fire for the Lord. Such a blessing. I was working out with a buddy of mine in the gym this week and we were talking about my daughter Sydney and uh, just what a special girl he is. And he goes, yeah, I read her posts on Facebook and the stuff she writes. Man, that girl is on fire for the Lord. And as a proud dad, I'm like, yes, she is, you know. You can see when God's spirit is stirred up in people. You can see their joy. You can see their passion. You can see their insight and their connection with God. However that may be manifested. Well, Simon sees this and he's like, man, I want to be able to walk over and put my hands on people and they get this power. Power, you know, I want it. I'll go on the traveling show, man. It'll be the Simon Circus. And we'll be laying hands on folks. And I'm going to touch you. No, I'm not. I'm going to touch No, I'm not. Oh, come on. Give me the power of I want the power, you know. This will be awesome. 
Simon's like, I want it. How much do I have to pay to get this power? Listen, you don't pay in the currency of man. You pay in the economy of God with prayer and obedience and fasting and Bible reading. God cannot be bought off. He wants to use God. He wants to use God. He said, verse 19, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God, Simon. It's not a circus. It's not a show. You just want this power for your own reasons. You're not in the right place. And they say, verse 22, Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me. <laughs> and this guy has no confidence in his own spirituality. Will you pray for me, you know? That none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Here's a guy in Simon that tried to use God. I found in my life, and I think we're all selfish by nature, at least in our fallen nature, we have to be careful that we don't go to God in prayer just to use God for our our own means. When I first began walking with the Lord at the age of 15, I didn't understand all this. And I treated God like he was my servant, you know? And it didn't work. Heaven was not opened. I I didn't have the connection with God that I was looking for. There was no power. The Holy Spirit wasn't upon me. And and I was disenfranchised with the whole Christian thing and thought, man, this this is lame. And then later I rededicated my life to the Lord. And the Lord helped me make a very important distinction. He said, Gary, the, the, the first time around, the reason it didn't work is because you tried to use me. Your attitude was, hey, you know, I could use a guy like Jesus on the Gary team. I don't come on your team, Gary. You come on my team. If we're going to do this again, this time it's going to be on my terms. And the Lord helped me to make that distinction. And you know what? I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. I wasn't even aware that I was using God and treating God like my servant. That's how deceptive and selfish our fallen nature can be. But I'll tell you this, when I got the roles in their proper place and began to be a servant and Jesus to be my king, heaven opened up and the power came and the Holy Spirit came upon and it was a completely different experience that carried me and carries me to this day by the grace of God. And so Simon is an example of someone who tried to use God for his own benefit. Whether it's monetary or just power, we we try to use God for a lot of different things. I want to show you next an example that's the complete opposite. While this revival is breaking out and people are coming to Christ and great things are happening there in Samaria, the Spirit speaks to Philip. Verse 26 Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. Let's stop there for a second. I want you to imagine all the great things that are happening. Revival's breaking out. People are being healed. God's using Philip in a major way. And now God speaks to Philip through this messenger and says, I want you to go down to Gaza. It's deserted. It's desert. There's no fame to be had there. 
There's nobody. And Philip goes. If he was in it for his own mean, his own gain, I think Philip would have argued with the Lord. But Lord, I'm the man here in Samaria. I mean, great things are happening. Why would you do this? The ministry's flowing. But Philip was a servant. He realized, I exist to be used of God. And if God wants to send me to the desert, I don't understand why, then that's what I do. So he went. It shows his heart. It shows his heart. So he arose and went, verse 27, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So there's this guy, he's in great power, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament, verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Okay, I want you to picture the scene. The guy's in a chariot, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, you see that chariot down there? I'm speaking to this man. He's searching, and he's about ready to find, I'm going to use you to lead him to Christ. So go overtake this chariot. And so Philip's run, running down the road, catches up to this chariot, and as he gets close, he hears the guy reading from Isaiah's prophecy. And so Philip comes alongside the chariot, and he's like, hey, buddy, what you reading there, you know? You got to use your imagination when you read the Bible. And this dude, he's of power and authority, he's like, who are you? I'm the guy that understands that book you're reading, that's who I am crazy i love it so philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet isaiah and said to him do you understand what you're reading and he said how can i unless someone guides me and he asked philip to come and sit with him the place in the scripture which he read was this he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent so he opened not his mouth In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch asked Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophecy say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Friends, you realize you can preach Jesus from any page in the Bible? It all points to him. And Philip put the focus right on Jesus. So beautiful, so humble. It's all about the Lord. And so, verse 36, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized. Somehow, Philip began with that scripture in Isaiah and shared the whole gospel message with this Ethiopian eunuch. Even to the point of, hey, you know, the Old Testament speaks of Jesus and that's what Isaiah was writing about, that the Messiah would come and first not as a conquering king but as a suffering servant. And he shared the life of Christ and even how the Old Testament pointed to Christ and what Jesus did and and now the birth of the church and hey, the sign that you've become a believer and a follower of Christ is to get baptized and he explains all this theology to this man and they come across the body of water and he's like, hey, well, let's do this. What prevents me from being baptized right now? So baptism was an important part of the gospel message that Philip presented. Verse 37, then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when he had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more 
and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So, what happened? I mean, he was caught away, and all of a sudden, the Ethiopian's like, Philip's gone, and he reappears miles away in this other town. And we don't know if the Lord supernaturally teleported Philip from one place to the next. That word caught away is the same concept we use of the rapture of the church. Certainly if the day can come <clears throat> where all the believers are going to be caught away, not just from this place to that place, but from earth to heaven, God could give a snapshot of that here in the life of Philip and say, hey, buddy, I just want to bless you. You went down to the desert on assignment because I wanted to use you and you were obedient. And so, hey, let's have a little fun and I'm just going to take you over here real quick. And bloop, all of a sudden, Philip gets this joy of experiencing God. We don't know exactly what took place. But I'll tell you what, there's going to be a whole lot of that kind of stuff and more going on up in heaven when we get into the kingdom. With our resurrected bodies, we'll be able to do things that we can't even comprehend here on earth. But it's important for us to realize that Simon was a guy who tried to use the Lord where Philip was a guy who was being used by the Lord. Who do you think was happier? Isn't there great joy and peace and happiness in just being a servant of the Lord? Philip didn't need to be the center of attention there in Samaria when the revival was going on. He was just a content to go visit one person in the desert. It didn't matter to him. I'm a servant of the Lord. I just want to experience Jesus. He didn't get caught up in all the hype of the ministry. He just wanted to get caught up in the spirit of the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing. Remember back with me as we begin to close this morning when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to the Lord with a personal request. A very selfish request on Jesus' part. Lord, I know they're about ready to arrest me and put me on trial and crucify me and I don't want to go. I think we for, forget sometimes that Jesus was a man. As a man, he didn't want to be cut open. He didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to be tortured. Hello? I mean, sometimes I think we, we, we see Jesus as some Marvel comic superhero. He bled. He hurt. And he prayed very selfishly, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to drink this cup of suffering. That's not what I want. I want to go eat an ice cream cone someplace. I don't want to go to the cross. Here's the difference. Did he have a request? Yeah. Did he ask God for what he wanted? Yeah. But then Jesus said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the ultimate. That's where we have to bring it. That's where we have to leave it. Lord, this is what I want. This is what I desire. Nevertheless, it's not you carrying out my will that this is about. It's me carrying out your will. And you might say, well, yeah, but that got Jesus killed. No, that got Jesus perfectly in the plan of God. Did he suffer? Did he hurt? Did he go through sacrifice? Absolutely. Is there sacrifice and some suffering and some self-denial as a part of the Christian life? Absolutely. But you and I are here today on this Sunday morning worshiping, following, being inspired by and having hope in Christ. 
because he's the ultimate example of one who was used by God. And he didn't just suffer on the cross. He was resurrected from the tomb and overcame all that stuff by the power of God. Amen. So let me just ask you kind of a soul-searching question as we close this morning. Right now, the way your life is going, would you say that you're trying to use God more or you're letting God use you more? Whose will have you been thinking about the most? Because it's very, very common for us just to think about what we want. And to even get mad at God when it doesn't happen. The most content and happy place to be is in a place of surrender. A place of surrender. Why do you want your will to be done? Because you think you'll be happy. If I get this and if that happens, oh Lord, I'll be so happy. Well, do you know that you can have happiness apart from your circumstances? You can have joy apart from your circumstances. You can have peace apart from your circumstances. When you have happiness, joy, all these things from the Lord, then you don't need all those things to line up as much because you realize the most important thing in life is the fruit of God's Spirit, and I already have that. And I have that, and it transcends all this other stuff going on in my life. So I don't need that deal to go through. I don't need that person to fall in love with me. I don't need everything to work out at the church the the way I think it should work out. I just need to walk with Jesus. And then all that other stuff will be what it's going to be, but I'm going to have contentment because I'm in the Spirit with Christ. And then I can take that contentment, that power, that happiness into the endeavors of my life. And my relationships will be better. My business will be better. The church will be better. So don't get the cart before the horse. Just walk with Jesus. We find ourselves so often, Lord, I gotta have this, and Lord, I gotta have that, and if that doesn't happen, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, sometimes the Lord goes, oh man, you're so far off track. I can't give you what you want because it's just gonna lead you further into your own selfishness. You're under a delusion that that's what life is all about. Life isn't about your will being done. It's about God's will being done. You didn't exist to please yourself. You were created to please God. So now I, I, I got to kind of do a little maneuvering here in your life. The sooner we surrender and find our happiness just in Christ and Christ alone, he doesn't have to take us through some of those school of hard knocks and we can just get to the good stuff. How many of you have hit your head against the wall too many times just trying to get your will done and do it your way? And Half of you. The other half of you are either so in tune with the Spirit you don't know what the flesh is like (laughs) or using God. I want to challenge you this week to have a spirit that just says, God, use me. And he will. And your flesh might, might say, you know what? I just really feel like God's using me right now. Uh, Yeah, he is. Your flesh might squirm, but your spirit will be so empowered. And that's where true happiness is found. Let's stand up and let's ask God's help for this. Amen.